All right, students, thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at toxicology, which is the study of things that are toxic, and risk management, how we can work with these chemicals once we know that they're toxic. This presentation will help you understand the study of hazards and their effects, risk assessment and risk management, and policy and regulation once we know that certain things are dangerous, how do we deal with that? Keep in mind that toxic can start here in the factory as a new chemical and these chemicals can be used for our consumer products that we use in our homes, workplace products and work, medicines and materials, pesticides and fertilizers, and then through this process of manufacturing there's waste which can go into the ground, into our ground water and, uh, and surface water and into the air. And these can ultimately find their way into the environment, into all living beings in that environment. And they also find their way into us from the consumer products we use, the workplace exposure, um, medicines we take, food, drinking water, air we breathe. And if it goes into us, it's also going to go into our, our babies. So this is a big topic. Toxicants concentrate in water. Surface water and groundwater can accumulate these toxic toxicants. And so when water lands on ground, it flows into um, it flows downhill and will pool in areas where you will get a lake or a pond or a creek or a river. So runoff from large areas of land, what we call watersheds, uh, drains into water bodies becoming concentrated. And toxicants in groundwater or surface water reservoirs used for drinking water pose potential risks to human health. The last place really that we want pollutants to go is into our groundwater because it's very difficult to remove pollutants from that and we need that groundwater. We, uh, we pump it up with wells and we use it for our drinking and for other purposes. So who are the most contaminated people on the planet? Not a happy question to ask and maybe an unexpected answer. You might think that it's people who are living in industrial areas, but actually it's quite the opposite. It's the Inuit, which are the Native Americans of the um, Northern, Amer Northern America, the Arctic region, what we might call Eskimos. And um, to give you an example, PCBs, which is a type of chemical used in, in the mostly electronics industry, are carried thousands of miles from developed nations of the temperate zone, so areas around the equator um, or north and south, up to the Arctic, where they are found in tissues of polar bears and seals. Inuit people who then eat the polar bears and seals accumulate these toxins in their own bodies. So they are very far removed from the technology of the products we use and those contam contaminants, yet their bodies have the highest concentration of many of our most toxic chemicals. So how does this happen? It's called the grasshopper effect. In the grasshopper effect, volatile chemicals, that means chemicals that can evaporate easily, can travel long distances on atmospheric currents. And by long distances, we mean halfway around the world. Um, so what you have here is in temperate areas where it's warmer, you get evaporation of these, of these chemicals. And, um, and they may then redeposit, but they're evaporating faster than they're redepositing. And then we would redeposit through precipitation, rain, snow, etc. Once they're in the atmosphere, they can travel long distances and then become deposited in the north. And in the north, it's colder, you're getting more deposition, you're getting less evaporation, so there tends to be an accumulation in these areas. And um, we call it the grasshopper effect because the toxins where they end up is far from where they started. Let's take a look at this concept of persistence. Some chemicals are more stable than others, persisting for longer in the environment. And DDT and PCBs are both very persistent. They can last for 10, 20, 30, 40 years in the environment. Very strong molecule, hard to break. Whereas BT toxin in genetically modified crops is not persistent and it might last a matter of, of weeks or months. The rate of degradation of these molecules is affected by temperature, moisture, sun exposure, etc. Especially the strong UV rays coming from the sun. Most toxicants degrade into simpler breakdown products. And some of these, however, are also toxic. For example, DDT breaks down to DDE, which is also toxic. 
So when you have chemicals persisting in the environment, they find their way into the tissues of living organisms. Now the body may excrete, degrade, or store toxicants. Uh, ideally we excrete them. If we, if we take them into our body, our body has a way of um, excreting them out. They, our bodies can also degrade them. Our, one of the functions of our liver is to break down toxins. But sometimes these toxins get stored, especially if they are fat-soluble ones, which are stored in body fat. DDT is persistent and fat-soluble, so it's out there in the environment and it builds up in our tissues. That process is called bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulated chemicals may be passed on to animals that eat the organism up the food chain. And we have bioaccumulated toxins in our own bodies, although we don't have animals eating us, hopefully. Let's take a look at a little, uh, little animation here, a little um, stop motion animation of bioaccumulation. We have a fish here, we have food that contains some kind of toxic um, molecule. Let's see what happens as the fish eats them. So these toxic molecules end up staying in his body, even though he's going to be excreting waste from the food he's eating. These chemicals, if they're fat soluble, will stay in his body. Now, there's another process called biomagnification, which is, um, well, it's the same basic process. It's the idea that toxins stay, um, accumulate in our bodies. But now we're looking at different trophic levels and what happens to the level of those toxicants as we move up trophic levels. Let's take a look. So we have fish that already have some toxicants. This one's going after some more. And now here comes big daddy fish. Eating the little fish. Every fish he eats, he's storing some of those toxins in his body. And keep in mind, because of the 10% rule, he has to eat, um, you can say roughly, mm, 10 times more his mass uh, to meet his nutritional requirements. So he's going to be storing a lot of these chemicals in his body. Alright, so that was biomagnification, which is just bioaccumulation, but to with higher concentrations as we go up food chains. We can see that in this diagram here, where at each trophic level, co uh, chemical concentration increases. If you take a look at, here we have water, which has um, some amount of, in this case, we're looking at DDT. And that means that the, um, the phytoplankton are going to get some of that um, phyto, some of that DDT going on to the zooplankton, to the fish, small fish, large fish, and finally to um, a top carnivore like an osprey. Look at these DDT concentrations, starting off very small, just in the water, but then accumulating even in little phyto um, or little zooplankton organisms. Now look carefully at this number, 0 0.04, 0 0.5, it's a difference of roughly 10 times, going to 2, then 25, another difference of roughly 10 times. So this is related to that 10% rule. Um, and we can see that concentrations, generally speaking, will multiply by roughly a factor of 10 as we go up to higher trophic levels. This is one of the reasons why it was um, why the condor became so vulnerable to the presence of DDT in the environment because they are very high on the food chain. So they ended up accumulating, um, uh, bioaccumulating large concentrations of DDT. Keep in mind that not all toxicants are synthetic. And here we see a poisonous mushroom. So although toxicology tends to focus on man-made chemicals, it's important to keep in mind that there are plenty of natural toxicants. And many are toxins produced by animals or plants for protection against predators and pathogens. For example, our poisonous mushroom. Let's study some of the effects of hazards or ways that we can study them. This is what toxicologists do. They study effects in several major ways. You know, if we're going to use these chemicals, we need to know what are their effects on the environment. So we do wildlife toxicology studies. We do human epidemiological studies and dose response studies in the lab, which is animal testing. So first, wildlife toxicology. These correlate chemical presence 
in the environment and its effect on animals in the field. So for example, we see some DDT eggs here. DDT was seen in nature to cause thinning of bird eggs and a drop in fertility. This would be an example of a study of toxicology that we call wildlife toxicology. Human epidemiology is obviously now we're relating to humans, and it's where human studies are relying on case histories, where you have observation and analysis of individual patients. For example, someone who was exposed to a toxin, maybe they got some chemical spilled on them, uh, maybe they accidentally drank some poison, and if they're the first person to have this happen to them, then that information is extremely helpful to, um, to, to doctors. But we also rely on epidemiological, epidemiological studies, long-term, large-scale comparisons of different groups of people. So you might have um, groups of people who lived in a certain area where there was known to be maybe some groundwater contamination, and you might follow them over a very long period of time to see the effects of that pollution. Now there's one classic case of the Mad Hatters who used mercury to make felt for hats in the early 1900s. Why were they called mad? They started to go crazy, and um, mercury is a potent neurotoxin, so it was affecting them um, in some pretty horrible ways. And um, so that's this is the case where studying this group of people would be an example of human epidemiology. So what are the advantage of this? Well, first of all, it's realistic. You're not using animals as model for humans. All real life factors are included. The disadvantages are we're seeing statistical correlation only. We're not actually um, explaining the process by which these chemicals cause um, problems, and it does not prove causation necessarily, or in some cases it can, but it doesn't always. And it can take many years to get results. Um, interesting case of mixing toxicology with anthropology, where we were just studying, this is described in your book, children were tested for pesticide effects in this study. There were two areas in Mexico, not too far from each other. One area was children growing in the foothills where there was very little exposure to pesticides that were being used. And you can see here some drawings, this one from a four-year-old and the one on the right from a five-year-old. And they're pretty typical pictures for what you expect for somebody at that age. So these are drawings by non-exposed children. But then the drawings from children exposed to pesticides who lived in the valley where there was um, pesticide contamination. You can see that there's a lot of um, a lot of developmental problems going on here. They are not able to form, um, you know, the drawings the same way. It's pretty evident that there's something going on with their development. And so we can correlate this change to the chemical, but why it occurs and how it occurs that would remain to be investigated. Let's take a look at that third way, dose response analysis, which is a method of determining toxicity of, of a substance by measuring response to different doses. Lab animals are used, and mice and rats breed quickly and give data relevant to humans because they are mammals like us. We have to say relevant, you know, it gives data that is useful to humans, but certainly not equivalent to humans because we are different species, even though we're both mammals. And the responses to doses are plotted on a dose response curve. Let's take a look at what one of those looks like. You have here two variables. On the horizontal is dose going from low to high. On the vertical is percentage of test population killed by that dose. So let's just say that you have 100 rats and you want to see what um, chemical X does to them. You would, um, you would take those 100 and you would apply um, you'd apply increasing doses, or you would actually you would take some, and to some of them you would give a low dose, to some of them you give a medium dose, to some of them give you, you give a high dose. And you do this for a wide range of doses, and you see for each of the groups that you give it to, how many of them survive. So here we can see that at low doses, actually um, none of them are killed, 0%. At some point though, you reach a dose at which you start to see death of some percentage of the test population, and that's called the threshold. And the other important number here is the LD50, which is lethal dose of 50%. It is the value at which, um, the dose at which half of your test population will die. So it looks like this. You would start to find that value. You would draw, make your curve. Then you would find a 50% point, and you would 
um, go across your curve, and then you would drop down, and where it hits your dose axis would be the dosage that 50% of them died at. <clears throat> so this is used to compare the toxicity of different chemicals. We test them this way. And of course, there's some um, argument over whether that's effective. First of all, we're not doing this on humans, and that's primarily what we're concerned about with new chemicals. And secondly, it involves killing a large number of animals and obviously a lot of suffering. So these dose response curves allow us, give us some tool to predict effects of higher doses. By extrapolating the curve out to higher values, we can predict how toxic a substance may be to humans at various concentrations. Um, you know, predict using, using that data, but it's not an exact science. In most curves, response increases with dose, but this is not always the case. I want to give you an example. With endocrine disruption, it may decrease as the body's defense system begins to recognize the toxin as foreign. Remember that the endocrine system is a system of our body where you have cells and receptors on cells that are extremely sensitive to low doses of some chemical messenger in your body. A chemical messenger that might have started um, in your um, in your let's see adrenal gland and then it makes the horm um, hormone adrenaline which flows through your blood over to some other part of your body or um, I'll give you another example here um, we have parts of our body that produce our sex cells like testosterone and as we're growing that signal of testosterone in our blood directs our cells to either develop us into a male or a female these are generally very low concentration molecules um, and so what can happen is when you have a toxicant, an endocrine disruptor, in a very low concentration, your body is pretty easily fooled by that because it's used to seeing low concentrations. But if you increase that concentration um, to a certain high level, your body will begin to recognize it as foreign. And it will actually then amount some kind of a protective response to it. It will maybe um, begin to form some way of... Um, of excreting it from your body, of detoxifying it, um, breaking it down, things like that. So it can actually be better at that point at a higher dose. What are some factors that affect toxicity? Keep in mind that not all people are equal and sensitivity to toxicants can vary with sex, male, female, age, weight, etc. But we can say a couple of general things. Babies and older people or those in poor health are more sensitive. You know, take a baby, for example, they take many more breaths than we do because they have smaller lungs, and so they're naturally bringing in more toxins. And, um, of course, older people, they are, their systems, their liver is not as effective at breaking down um, toxins and things like that. There are two types of exposure that we talk about. The first is acute, which means high exposure in a short period of time. This would be like when you accidentally drank a poison or you got something poisonous spilled on you. Whereas chronic is lower amounts over a long period of time. You know, people who, are cro who experience um, chronic problem or chronic sm smoking, for example, can cause chronic toxicity because those chemicals are certainly bad for you, but they're not going to kill you immediately. You're getting a low dosage of those, maybe over a period of years or decades over which you, which you smoked. Um, and so let's take a look at mixture of toxicants. This gets a little interesting because substances may interact when they're combined together. And mixes of toxicants may cause effects greater than the sum of their individual effects. And these are called synergistic effects. And it's a challenging problem for toxicology because there is no way to test all possible combinations. It becomes an almost infinite number of combinations. And the environment contains complex mixtures of many toxicants. We did see one example of a synergistic effect I'm going to remind you about. I had you read a section in your book um, a couple of units ago about frogs or amphibians being good indicator species for toxic chemicals. And they did a study where they took some amphibians, you might recall, and they put a toxic um, chemical into the water. Um, and they found that the, the frogs and the amphibians generally were not that affected by it until they added in a predator. And the stress of the frogs having that predator present caused them to now have a reaction to that chemical toxicant. And so um, this is an example of a synergy or a synergistic effect 
where the two, one plus one does not equal two, one plus one equals three or four or five, where the sum of the parts is greater than the individuals combined. So what we're gonna do in our next section is taking, take a look at risk. So turn it into part two.